Well, having been in the market for 40 years, I have developed no skill whatsoever in forecasting the market. I would say to people, if you enjoy that, if you think you can listen to the news in the morning and work out what happened in the United States and that guides your investing, well, give it your best shot. I don't think I've seen anyone who can do it long term. G'day, and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello, and my guest today is Graham Hand, the Managing Editor of First Links. G'day, Graham. Hi, Phil. How are you doing? Good. Now, First Links is a community that shares knowledge and investing battle scars without pushing any particular products or services. Graham has 42 years' experience in financial markets, starting at the Commonwealth Bank in 1976, and in 2001, you published your first book, Naked Among Cannibals, an analysis of the evolution of Australian banking. That's a lurid name for a book about banking. Where did it come from? Well, in publishing, particularly in finance, you've got to get people's attention. So while Shares for Beginners is obviously an excellent name. um, (laughs) It's not very lurid. (laughs) It's not very lurid. I thought I would have something that would jump off the page. So we went for the word naked. Mm -hmm. And what was it about? It's about how the Australian banking system had changed over the years. I used to have a subtitle from revered to reviled. And so you had the bank manager used to be a pillar of the community. And we know what's happened with the banking system since. So I tried to trace that journey. And it's 20 years ago nearly. Has that process continued, do you think? Look, interesting question, because uh, when the Royal Commission was held, the Financial Services Royal Commission, Noel Whittaker actually wrote an article which said, Graham Hand covered all of this 20 years ago. (laughs) Um, And so anyone who sat through the fascinating Royal Commission would say not much changed. But I think a lot has changed since the Royal Commission. And, you know, banks have really stepped up to the plate, having paid, you know, a billion dollars in remediation costs because they didn't listen earlier. And it's interesting as well, the, um, I think it was the Fin Review yesterday or the day before, I can't remember about the amount of fees that um, the whole industry has taken out of the superannuation scheme. And we're going to be covering the superannuation scheme. But um, there's, there's been a gravy train for a long time, hasn't there? There has been, but I am not quite so critical because if I think about what you can do with your superannuation, and we will get onto this later, for probably 0.7%, you can have your superannuation actively managed by a professional group of people. There's a call center you can speak to. There's regular reports. And for me, that's not bad value for for money. You can do it cheaper. um, But obviously, when you multiply three trillion times, you know, one percent, you come up with a big number. Something that I've been discussing with a couple of other guests is the way in the financial advice in the past was about giving a glossy brochure to a retiree. And it's completely changed now, hasn't it? It has changed and it's changed for the better. I used to get annoyed in the past if financial planners used to talk about primarily about investing. And I remember once going to a financial planner with my mother, who was 84 at the time. And when he found out about me, he just wanted to talk about investing markets. What did I think was going to happen to the stock exchange? Well, that's not investing for for me. And I like to talk about, you know, what do you want to do with your money? And there's a different conversation. So Graham, The reason I asked you onto the podcast is because of a presentation I saw you give at an Australian Shareholders Association meeting about investing for the long run, and it seemed like the perfect answer to a question from a listener, Seb Armstrong, who wants to explore portfolio construction. Stocks, ETFs, bonds, cash, property, etc. have all been discussed, but how should one balance these depending on their objectives? Thanks so much, Seb. So (laughs) is there any overview that you can give to that question? I think one of the the things that comes to mind is the idea of asset allocation. The way I think about investing, Phil, I I have a sort of six-step process, which I always keep in mind. And if if anyone wants to have a dinner conversation, um, I start at that point. And I always start by saying, well, what what do you want to achieve with your investing? Because if, if you're... 25 years old and you want to buy a house in a couple of years and you're saving for a deposit, you don't really have much choice other than keep it into cash. And just accept at the moment you're going to be lucky to get half a percent and that's just the way the world is at the moment. Because if you're desperate for a house, 
you don't want to lose 20 or 30 percent on your deposit and compromise your main goal. But if you're 40 years old and you're putting, you know, 10 percent of your income into superannuation, the rest is your living expenses plus perhaps paying off your home loan. Then your investment side of that, you really should try and think of that as a 30 year plan. So you're 40 years old, you're going to need the money when you're 70. And so the first thing I always say is what's your goal? Because that's totally dependent. I mean, I've got a 34 year old daughter who's saving for a house and, you know, she's got a very conservative portfolio as a consequence. So having decided that, then I would say, what's your risk appetite? Because there's no point in saying, uh, I need to save for the long run, so I'm quite happy to go into shares. But the moment the market falls 20%, you panic and, and sell. And that sort of buying and selling and you know buying in euphoria and selling at the bottom, that's what often undermines a good investment uh, plan. And so you've got to know your risk appetite, not when times are good, but how are you going to react when the market's down? The reality is that the, the market has a 10% correction every couple of years. So don't think that corrections are unusual. And it actually has a 50% correction every 20 years. So everyone should expect that from the stock market holdings. So you know, know your goals, understand your risk appetite. And then we get on to what you just mentioned, Phil, about asset allocation and portfolio construction. And I talk about asset allocation being the broad categories that you mentioned, bonds, shares, property. And having decided on that, then what specific assets would you put into each of those categories? So that's where I get into um, the sort of things that your listener had asked about. Now, assets, even though you can find them on the share market, assets are different styles of investments. I mean, most people think of the share market as being where you invest your money. But let's just go through just uh, briefly. There's bonds, there's property, fixed income. They're the, they're the broad categories. They're the main ones, the traditional. Yes. Then you've got a whole range of what you might call alternatives. And each one of these has their own risk return characteristics. And generally, you would say that the least risky is cash, but you get the lowest return at the moment. The cash rate is 0.25%. You can get a bit better than that by shopping around for special offers. But if you've got 1% on your cash, good result. Don't expect any more. The issue with bonds at the moment, where you would traditionally say that's a defensive, lower risk um, asset, is that interest rates are very low. And if interest rates were to rise, then the capital on a longer term bond would be eroded. I never get that, that 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 idea that you know when interest rates go up bonds go down. Yeah. But, yeah, that's it, just that's a broad thing to keep in mind isn't it about bonds. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They're great when the interest rates are low. Well, the perfect world that I've invested in in the past is you get 10% on your bonds, right? Mm. And then what you might categorize as a 50-50 portfolio, say 50% growth, 50% defensive. The so-called defensive part of it, the bond part of it. If you were to get 10%, fantastic. I mean, even 5% would be would be fine. The portfolio construction um, problem we have at the moment is that defensive part of the portfolio, cash, term deposits, bonds, to some extent property, is very low yielding. And people will say, well, what do I do about that? And the answer to that is, that's the way it is. You know, there's, there's no magic um, putting in the investing world. If you want to start to get more from your bonds, you have to take more risk. And then you have the problem that you may not be repaid your your principal. But just to continue that uh, journey on risk and return, if you want the higher returns that equities normally deliver over time, then you have to accept some short-term risk. But going back to my earlier point, if if you're able to think about your investing over decades, say 30 years, then you can tolerate some of that short-term risk in the confidence that over time, your portfolio will probably do well. ShareSite is an online portfolio tracking tool that automatically records trades, dividends, ETF distributions, and gives you the reporting tools you need to help you manage your portfolio. ShareSite is pleased to extend a special offer to listeners of this podcast. Save four months on an annual premium plan. Go to sharesite.com slash shares for beginners and sign up now for a free trial before taking advantage of four free months. It'll help you save money at tax time and improve your investing decisions. That's sharesite.com slash shares for beginners. Mm. 
Let's turn to the presentation. Okay. And we've got one of the slides up here. This is the intergenerational report highlights. And it's basically figures about um, what's going to be happening over the years, how many, uh, how many workers there are for each retiree and the cost of health in the future. Talk, talk to us about this particular slide, which, if it's okay with you, we can publish yeah. this on the blog post as well to refer yeah, to. So, yeah, so these numbers come from the intergenerational report, and actually a new one is due to be published soon. And it's it might sound a bit dry, but I think it's a fascinating document because it does talk about what Australia is going to be like in 2050. So that is a 30-year picture. And again, traditionally, people used to think about um, working and then maybe only spending five or 10 years in retirement. So superannuation and retirement savings didn't have such a challenge. But now anyone who's reasonably healthy and living in Australia, someone who's born now, uh, a man would have a life expectancy of 92 and a woman 94. And even now, if, if one of a couple is 60 years old, there's a 50% chance one of those will live to be 90. So people should think about their life as working probably as long as they can, but say they can't work past 60, then how are you going to live for the next 30 years? Which leads to the other point that some people say, well, I'll be able to rely on the pension even if I don't save enough. And the issue is that the draw on on pensions and health is increasingly taking a lot of the budget. So it's a it's a big call to say that in twenty or thirty years that the current levels of pensions and support for the health system will still be as good. I mean it's quite possible that in twenty or thirty years from now, when the people who are thirty are then sort of fifty or sixty maybe the largest voting block. And they may say, why are we paying for these pensioners who should have saved more 30 years ago? So I think relying on the age pension is not a good uh, strategy. And as that uh, says, that health is currently 4.5% of Australia's GDP, rising to 7.1%. I tell you, if you're having just spent a few hours in hospital with my 88-year-old mother... When you go in a hospital, you want to make sure you can afford the best care possible, right? At that point, you're not going to regret paying 1% more on your taxes, I promise you. Let's talk a bit about the market. And you mentioned that the markets go up and down all the time, and you gave some figures about that. But um, a lot of people think that they can try and forecast the market. But this is a mugs game, isn't it? Well, having been in the market for 40 years, I have developed no skill whatsoever in forecasting the market. I would say to people, if you enjoy that, you know, if, if you think you're good at it, if you think you can listen to the news in the morning and work out what happened in the United States and that guides your investing, well, give it your best shot. You know, who am I to tell you what to do and if you enjoy it? I don't think I've seen anyone who can do it um, consistently long, long term. And just let's look at the last six or seven months, right? In February, as coronavirus started to hit people were saying you know we're going to have um, a deep recession people and businesses are closing and so things are going to be really bad and indeed until March they were and then since March the market has had this excellent recovery and has regained much of what it's lost in March but all of that is history none of that matters for your investing from today so the issue is where do we stand today and I absolutely promise you, I could paint a, a scenario that is positive and negative. I could talk about vaccines and the world going to growth. I could talk about no vaccines for, th for three years, loss of job, closure of, of business. And it's all a bit of a rave. And I very often see commentators say, on the other hand, this and on the other hand, that. That's why I say it's not about the next three or six months. It's about the next 30 years. And it's true, isn't it? So many commentators, they... They hedge their bets. You listen to someone talking, and I think we've got here a, a, an excellent one. This is um, a famous business columnist who shall remain unnamed. And what did he say? Well, it says th this was uh, the headline um, where it was like behind the share correction. So you think you're going to get some insight. And it starts, it's not a fundamental reversal. But if this correction turns nasty, 
things could get much worse. <laughs> I mean, what does that tell you? <laughs> That's excellent, isn't it? So forecasting is a mugs game. And I guess this is part of the point is you've got to have that view that you've got to be in there for a long time. And this graph, which we're referring to as well, the most important thing to avoid, the real investor strategy. Yeah, and you see this a lot in financial markets where people get confident and they buy when the market's high. I'll, I'll just give a little description yeah, here before, so yeah. people know what we're talking about. It's the S&P, the US S&P 500 stock price index from 96 to about 2015. And it's going up and it, as it goes up, it goes buy, buy, buy. <laughs> and... And then as it goes down, it sell, sell, sell. And this is what people are doing. They're buying and selling at the wrong times. And it happens over and over again. It does. I mean, I worked for a, a Colonial First State for 12 years, and we would see this all the time. When the market fell, um, people would panic and you get heavy redemptions. And then the market slowly recovers. And a couple of years later, the market's higher and they start to invest again. And Kern Nielsen of Platinum, you know, very well-known uh, fund manager, got his analyst to do a check on the flows within the Platinum funds. And he worked out that if you weighted the returns according to when people actually invested and when they, uh, with, when they withdrew, they would have earned 6% less than if they just stayed in the fund all the time. This is a few years ago. And so you see these patterns repeat regularly. It's the emotions, isn't it? The people trying to predict what's going to happen. Yeah. So let's talk about setting up a long-term portfolio and get into the nuts and bolts of it. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk about a sample portfolio that you provided us in this um, in this meeting, and I was really impressed with it. So tell us about this portfolio and what's involved in it and how it's constructed. So. As I was saying earlier, you've got to start with your goals and your risk appetite and then decide how would you construct a portfolio. So I put this slide together to show how your portfolio might change according to your risk horizon. So that person who's saving for something for uh, two years, they might put a bit into shares and global shares, but they have a portfolio that's dominated by defensive bonds, which might be Australian or global and then put some into um, alternatives. This might be infrastructure stocks, uh, might be private equity and other alternative asset classes. Then as your investment horizon goes out to say five years, five years might be considered more of a balanced portfolio. And that's where you get into something that's normally like 50-50. 50% goes into global or Australian shares, 50% into the more aggressive, the growth categories of equities. And then what I've labeled eight years, but I really think more as a longer term portfolio, where you get very heavily weighted into growth, growth assets. And really, if you can tolerate the risk involved in being equities, then there's a strong case to be overweight equities more than 50-50, and being more like 80-20. And I've got a friend who I've known for decades, who He's very risk tolerant. He never looks at the share market. He actually just thinks uh, about the equities in terms of his dividends. And even during what's happening with COVID-19, even though companies have been reducing dividends, you can still get 4 or 5% with franking on your share portfolio while bonds and term deposits are offering, say, 1%. So if you can tolerate the fact that you're going to have some capital gains and losses on your share portfolio, then if you can tolerate that, you should go more into shares. And you've got these broadly categorized as growth assets and income assets. So growth assets are like shares, basically, and the income assets are the bonds and cash and so forth. Yeah, that's just to come up with a general categorization. But these days, the growth assets often pay more income than what you might call the income assets that's to say where is most of the return going to come from because if you put money into a term deposit there's no growth involved at all right that's all about income the cheap the cheap portfolio okay so we're we're going to talk now about the cheap etf portfolio this is a great example of how to construct a portfolio so look this podcast is called shares for beginners and so while i've been talking generally about portfolio A lot of people who are listening will actually be doing their investing on the stock exchange. So I put this together to show that you can do your own investing, but you don't have to say, you know, am I buying BHP versus 
Rio? Am I buying Woolworths versus Coles? You don't have to become a stock picker. You can still go into these broad categories that I've described, mainly through exchange-traded funds, the ETFs. But there are also listed investment companies, LICs, our listed investment trusts, which in First Links we discuss a lot about the merits of ETFs versus LICs. I should say, if I forget to mention it, that First Links is free to subscribe. So if anyone wants to go into that, you just go to our website and we write a lot about these subjects. But as I talked about earlier, um, Australian shares, global shares, listed property, bonds and alternatives, all of that can be bought by buying relatively inexpensive exchange-traded funds or ETFs. So tell us about the um, the examples here. You've got some example ETFs and how you would balance them. Just talk to us about each asset class and the ETF that you've got there. Yeah, so these are uh, examples. I mean, at the moment, there are about $70 billion worth of ETFs on the market and about $50 billion worth of listed investment companies. So there is about $120 billion to choose from. These are just examples. But you can get exposure to the Australian shares. The ASX code in this example is A200. And that only costs seven basis points. Now, that's 0.07%. These are the management fees. These are the management fees, yeah. Yeah. And I actually call that free investing. I mean, the market changes that much every 10 minutes, right? I mean, just last night, Wall Street moved over 1%. And I'm talking about 0.1% here. So when I say to people, you know, you can invest for free, they say, well, what do you mean? That's an example of what I mean. So that's a very cheap um, management fee. Because yeah. um, another listener was asking about the comparing two S&P 500 ETFs. Yeah. And the difference was 0.04 or 0.09. That's really not a lot of a difference. Nah, it's irrelevant, that. right? Yeah. It's irrelevant. Yep. You've got to understand that that, that is just like a, <laughs> a rounding error in, in a day's trading, whether you invested yesterday or tomorrow, it's just a tiny number. It's totally irrelevant. You should concentrate more on you know, what is the asset class that I'm worried about. And in fact, in Australia and global shares, um, this particular one, one um, VTS is a Vanguard fund that only costs four basis points. Like when I talk basis points, four is 0.04 percent, right? So this is tiny numbers, not four percent, 0.04 percent. And you can get uh, other asset classes like listed property. And I might think that property investing would be a more expensive, and it is a bit more expensive, but it's only a quarter of a percent. And I, I, in the bond market, that might cost you 0.2% for Australian or global bonds. And you can see if you add all of those up, you've got a portfolio that you're assembling, which is virtually free. And then I say, look, add some alternatives. In this particular case, I've listed um, HBRD is the code. That's hybrids. And they offer a better yield. So that's giving your income return a little bit of spice. And then GLIN is an infrastructure fund. So they invest in ports and pipelines and airports and buildings. And that's a little bit more expensive. But even with these so-called alternatives, that only costs you 0.75% as well. And then add a bit of cash for security. The largest cash ETF is the code is AAA. Um, and if you actually say, what does that entire portfolio cost me? A balanced portfolio for less than 0.2%. And, you know, you could put that portfolio together and put all your money into that portfolio. And look, I would say if you just did that for the next 30 years, that's probably as good as spending your entire life punting around the market. But, you know, as I say, if you enjoy, if, if you enjoy playing the market, well, go for it. Yep. And uh, don't put any too much money at risk if you're going to do that. Just, you know, maybe have a portfolio like this and then just um, a little bit for playing with. Look, there'll be people out there who bought Afterpay for $10 yeah. and say it's now $80. And mm -hmm. I say, like, good luck to you, right? There'll be someone who buys a share tomorrow for $80 and it'll go to 20 And that's fine. You know, you may do well for a number of years. And that's just an individual call on your own portfolio, but you're responsible for your own destiny. And again, I will uh, point out that we'll uh, put this on the blog post as well so that you can see this asset allocation. However, it is not advice to buy anything. We're not uh, doing that. We're just... Exactly. There's no financial advice here. Just talking about general long-term principles. Now, this is not actually your asset allocation, is it? It's someone else's. <laughs> that's right. I'm not sure... Um, 
if people see this this chart, which Phil will uh, put onto the blog, but the future fund is is always an interesting fund to look at their asset allocation because they have much less in Australian equities and in global equities, and they have more in what you would call alternatives, which are more like private equities and uh, infrastructure. They have um, quite a lot in uh, property. And uh, so it's a, it's a different sort of portfolio, somewhat reflecting the fact that they are investing uh, the retirement savings of public, of public servants and is probably designed to be not as exposed to the vagaries of the market day, day to day. But again, the, the Future Fund changes its portfolio regularly. So this portfolio that I've uh, put up may, be, may have changed uh, since. I'm not putting this up as an example of what people um, should do, but just, just as an example of how a professional investment team can take a different approach. And you can do something by yourself as well and mimic what a professional investment team is doing at, at almost next to no cost. You can do a lot more on, on things like infrastructure and debt funds. If, if, you, if you go on to the ASX, there's a, a lot of funds these days which go uh, not just into government bonds, but into non-investment grade bonds. And that way you can get some higher yield, but it comes with added risk. And you have to accept that. And there are some ETFs as well that do fixed income and they're fixed income based on corporate bonds That's rather right. than government bonds as well. That's right. So you could Google just like listed investment trusts and you would get, or you know, we talk about it a lot on First Links um, and there's a lot of examples. And look, the advantage of that is that fund manager, although they might be investing in corporate bonds, which are risky, they might hold three or 400 of them. So the amount that's exposed to one company is a lot less. In the podcast, we have covered ETFs many times, many people that work in the ETF industry, but um, we haven't really covered LICs so much. What's an LIC? What's the difference between an ETF and an LIC? Yeah, so LIC being listed investment company and, and sometimes uh, similarly listed investment trusts. Now, the big difference between the two, and I'll explain what I mean here, is that listed investment companies are what's called closed end. That is, they go to the market when they first issue and they might raise $200 million. And that's a company that then invests $200 million. And if someone wants to uh, get the money out or they want to invest more, the only way they can do that is on the share market. And that $200 million is invested in other shares. In other, other. Yeah, it, normally in other shares or in yes. other assets, or it might be in bonds. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so if you want to buy a listed investment company, you have to go onto the stock exchange and, and buy them. And uh, similarly, if you want to sell it, you have to go onto the stock exchange. Now, that can be a problem sometimes because if you're selling and there aren't very many buyers you may not get the value of the underlying assets. So as you say, Phil, that the fund might own other shares and the shares might be worth, say, a dollar in the listed investment company, but it might only be trading for 80 cents. So that $200 million might only be worth $160 million at that particular time in the market. Well, the, the, the fund itself may be worth $200 million, but no one in the market is bidding at the value of the assets. The mm. actual uh, price of the listed investment company might be only 80 cents. And so it can be difficult sometimes to sell at the value of the assets. Now, the difference is with exchange-traded funds. Now, this is getting a little bit technical, but with exchange-traded funds, they actually have market makers who ensure that the price that's on the exchange is the same as the value of the assets. Effectively, they, they create or redeem the underlying investments to ensure you can get the, the NTA or the value of the assets. And that's an important difference uh, because you may not be able to, to exit your position in a listed investment company at the value of the, of the assets. So there's a lot of other differences between them. Uh, an ETF is what's called an open-ended fund because the underlying manager can actually create new units or redeem units. 
it's an important distinction. There are all sorts of other things. A listed investment company is actually a company. So it has a board which determines, for example, how many dividends it would pay each year, just like BHP or, or Coles would. But it's important to know the differences. LICs have often been used for their income producing characteristics and AFI I think is one of the biggest ones yeah. isn't it in the in the market in this space yeah so there are some LICs that will specifically try and uh, market themselves and, and generate dividends but even if you look at this like Australian banks right they anyone who bought those as a dividend play has had to cope with the fact that the value of the shares has has fallen and so there's a certain amount of caution needed if you're just going to buy for dividends. It'd be quite easy to earn a 5% dividend and lose 10% on the shares. And then you, if, you, if you sell the shares, you haven't actually done very well over a short term. Okay, that's good. Now, um, you've already given a plug to, <laughs> to First Links, but let's hear about it again because I'm not sure if I've mentioned to you, but I do mention some of the posts from First Links. I've subscribed to the newsletter and I recommend to listeners to subscribe, to sign up and subscribe to, to First Links because there, there's some great stories and it's a great community of people with, with some great wisdom there. Where First Links is different than most newsletters is that we try and give like enduring investment ideas. And I like to think people can go through articles that we've published over the years and many of them would still be interesting. So we talk a lot about demographics, as we talked about earlier, you know, the aging of the population. We talk about uh, different structures and less about picking stocks. There are lots of newsletters that, that do that. And so people come to First Links to learn about investing skills rather than trying to decide whether they should buy... Uh, you know, mining stocks, or you know whether they should go into afterpay. I mean, we or do tech, cover those or lithium things. or whatever. Or they, yeah, we whatever. do cover those as general themes, but that's not our main emphasis. Okay, Graham, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's been great having you. Thanks for the invitation, Phil. Thank you. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Shares for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. Thanks to Christopher Soulos for music production with that special Greekalicious flavour. Remember, music always flows, even when the money won't.